Hey, how's it going? Today I would like to cover with you programming design principles. Not to be confused with programming design patterns, but design patterns are derived or driven by these programming design principles. Dare I call them that? Um, there's just a handful of them. They're pretty simple for the most part and like most simple things. They're easily complicated because for whatever reasons, when people try and exaggerate very simple stuff. But anyway, it's uh, let's just dive into it. Kiss, keep it short and simple. This, speaking of simple, this is what all the other design uh, principles and maybe even patterns hang upon is just that so this is the focus of everything i don't want to talk about it too much but um there's just if you if you don't have any reason how should i say this i just won't i'll just keep it short and simple and just not say anything go to the next slide do simple first is the easiest way to keep it simple don't do something complicated right out of the gate, like I almost did. Um, just do, say, write the simplest code that could possibly work. That's what test-driven development will drive you in this direction, because when done correctly, you should just be writing one very small test that tests for that thing you want to implement. You know, if you want to write hello world to the screen or something like that. And then you turn around after you write that one failing test and you write the smallest possible code that can make that failing test pass. And then refactor if necessary and then turn around and look at it and go, okay, is that enough? No, I need my program to do more. So you write a failing test, turn around and write the simplest thing that could possibly work. And that's what you do. And in doing so, you only write what's absolutely necessary and you don't overcomplicate things right out of the gate. Dry, do not repeat yourself, at least not more than a very few times. This is one of the principles that can probably be bent and probably should be bent before it's strictly enforced. Some people get too crazy about it when they first hear about this principle. I think everybody, including myself, and uh, that can lead to trouble because we kind of need to repeat ourselves to get that little thought in our mind like hey I've seen this before like this nested for loop that I'm writing to iterate through this multi-dimensional array I keep doing that and it keeps taking big chunks of my code maybe I should throw that out into its own little method function whatever you want to call it and just have a single statement there instead a single call to that method pass it a couple parameters or whatever and call it good from there. So by repeating ourselves a very few times, then we start to see those those patterns and then we can look at it like how what are the different ways I'm using these blocks of code that I'm repeating and how can I pull out what's the same and turn what varies into parameters and go that route. But before even taking it that far, usually I'll like if I am going to do the refactor to a method style thing. I'll just take each block of code and kind of separate it with some blank spaces in between, you know, separate it from the other blocks of code, and then slap a little comment right above it. What's that block of code doing? And if you especially haven't repeated yourself yet, then you could just kind of leave it like that. But then once you start repeating yourself and you see like, oh, I'm doing these same little blocks of code, then you can uh, just make a, maybe a function named after that comment that you slapped on top of there. Anyway, on to the next one. Principle of least astonishment. No surprise is measured by WTFs per minute when you open a source file. So you don't... It should take you less than a minute to go through a typical source file and become comfortable with it. If it if you can't do it in well under a minute, I mean not necessarily wrap your mind around every single line of code in the source file, but have a good idea of what's probably where. 
you know, already have the uh, the methods picked out. You found the method signatures, all that kind of stuff. Um, there should be probably multiple functions or methods in it usually. Stuff like that to where, or if there's not, even if it is a monolith, at least the code's, you know, well-structured. The, the shape of the code looks nice and properly commented just enough. Stuff like that. Um, if it's not, it comes back to that whole thing of the refactor to method, I think, is refactor to classes, whatever. But um, you just, you want it to feel like you can funnel into it, you know. If you're going into some construction project or something and you have all your materials nicely organized in your tools and everything, then it's probably a lot easier to uh, get started and feel comfortable and have a lot less anxiety than if things are just scattered around and you don't even know, you don't even know where to start kind of thing. So try and just not be surprising with your code. Try and just make it look almost boring, completely not clever. You don't want to do clever things. Keep those to a minimum. If you do have to do something clever, consider wrapping it in a function and hiding it in a little dark corner. And there's also another Pola, and that is a principle of least authority is what it's called. And that's about issuing just enough privilege as necessary. It has a little bit more to do with like operating systems and stuff like that. But since we've already used Pola, we're going to rename this or uh, go by its other name, which is pulp. And that's principle of least privilege. So that comes down to things like with Linux, for example, you have your own home directory and you can trash that home directory and it won't mess up, especially if it's on its own partition, you know, and constrained, size constrained so that it can't take up all the space on the hard drive and stuff like that. You can just totally go in as a user. You could put a monkey in front of the computer and, you know, if, as long as the keyboard and mouse and screen and stuff are tough enough, then nothing's going to happen to that to that data integrity inside of that system. Because that is if you are a regular user with regular user privileges, because the worst thing they can do is trash that home directory. They cannot trash the system. So that's the principle of least privilege is that you don't need administrator root access to do, especially not these days, maybe back last century with the way operating systems were, but especially pretty much from this century on, um, the vast majority of operating systems, a, a very few ones, except for a very few ones, um, Follow, tend to follow this type of principle. Windows is trying to catch up. It blames legacy stuff for um, being the cause of it, but I don't think that's necessarily true. And another thing, speaking of uh, the security stuff with Windows, is it has a very rich security system. And going back to that KISS principle, it doesn't keep it simple. It's such a rich security system. Back in the day, you may have... If you have some experience doing Windows administration and stuff, you've probably trashed a whole Windows folder tree just by dinking around with the permissions. And the next thing you know, they're out of control and you just, it feels impossible to get them back in whack. Um, that's the trade off. It, it doesn't keep it simple, so you can easily get things out of whack. But at the same time, you have very fine granular control over everything. So Linux and the Unix likes are a little bit more of a, the in-between, they've struck in that center balance more where it teeters right on almost overly complex versus uh, powerful enough to do most everything that you need to do. But anyway, yeah, the principle of least privilege is that you just want to give users just as much privilege as necessary to uh, do whatever they're going to do. So, like I said, a little bit more towards operating systems, but it's worth mentioning because especially with security being so important these days with logins and all that, whether it's on a local system or a remote system, something to keep in mind. Yagni, you ain't going to need it. So don't implement it until it's absolutely necessary because we'll never know less about the problem than we do right now. So if you're writing that program, just write it for the console first. If that's easier, just to 
do some system out, um, standard out text stuff, dump it out to the console, little debugging, logging info and stuff like that. And don't write that big, bright, shiny user interface because you may never need it. You know, you may never, that program might not come into full fruition and it might get tossed aside. So if you waste all that time implementing that user interface, chances are you're not going to need it. And that also forces you as a programmer to only implement stuff that is quote unquote absolutely necessary, absolutely needed. Because we all have a tendency to start thinking, especially um, leaning more towards being a beginner, that, you know, where do we start and where do we finish kind of a thing. And we get all those wild ideas and stuff in our head that, that we want to do, but we need to just put a very few things on our plate at a time per iteration and uh, prioritize by those, prioritize those uh, things on our plate by the, uh, the necessity of them and just implement that, give ourselves a little pat on the back or biscuit or whatever, and then implement the next thing and just do that in small increments. So that wraps up those simple basic principles that cover pretty much everything to do with programming every style of programming there is. These principles are the solid principles. They apply most directly to object-oriented programming, but for the most part, they can also apply to just about any other type of programming as well. But they're specifically targeted towards object-oriented programming. The first one is the S, and that's the single responsibility principle. That basically means you want each thing to do one thing and do one thing only, do that one thing well. So a class or method bound to only one aspect of specification, only one business reason to change. So if you're describing something and you say it calculates and displays a result, then it has too much responsibility. So that means that basically you have that algorithmic calculation going on and then you also have um, IO in the same exact method or class or whatever type of component it is and that's a surefire flag that it, those things need to be separated but instead of and if it's then in like a sequence then that's okay so if you have a method that just like procedurally calls other methods that might do multiple things but it's not it's doing this then that then that you know not a this and that kind of a thing, if that makes sense. So you could have a method that calculates a calls out to another method, like a sub method, and um, calculates, does a calculation, gets a result return, and then immediately following that calls a display function. That would be better, That that's a little bit different. But within it, if it's sort of like more of the low level details, if there's not that layer of abstraction there and it's calculating, you know, it's like literally if you have so like even Hello World is a perfect example of bad design because you literally have a hard coded string that you're that's right there, which you could substitute with a calculation like five plus plot five or something like that. And then you're literally calling like in a. JavaScript, you'd call console.log, and C, you'd call maybe puts or printf or something, and then in Java, system.out. That is a low-level system call, and you can see even just between the languages, it's a different call. But um, if you went even lower, like assembly language or, you know, more of the operating systems, direct system interface, then it's definitely going to be very different of a type of way of dealing with the I.O. So by abstracting that and pulling those things out. So if you just had that main method call, um, you know, some type of like get string type of a function to get that data, to get pull that hello world in from maybe like a globalized, internationalized file that has hello world written in a bunch of different languages. And it could call out to a method that determines the locale and pulls the correct stuff out of that file sends it all back, and then when it gets those values, whatever they happen to be, it doesn't have to even specifically look at them. It just knows they're in some compatible format. 
then then instead of and then refeed them out to another method that is ideally abstract that is going to like a display method you know and then that display method might turn around and call system out or you know depending on maybe a command line flag or whatever it might fire up some gui stuff and print out to a graphical display or to the web or a mobile interface or or all of the above you know so and then you can change it too you can dynamically change it by adding in that separation there so if you think back to that hello world style thing you can't change that you know that five plus five is calculated and automatically displayed to the console or whatever hard-coded in there so if you think on that level and scale it a little bit you can start thinking of how you can just go through and start splitting things apart and if we fail to follow this single responsibility principle then our programs will become rigid and inflexible which often is tied with being fragile as well so if your program's rigid then it's hard to make a change you might have to go in and make the change in a bunch of places for example that's rigid that's something you want to avoid you want to be able to go in and make that change in one place ideally and that way you don't have to worry about things coming out of sync you know just like that uh, nested for loop kind of a thing if you decide oh I'm gonna um, you know now I have to deal with a array that's a different size and I had hard-coded in the size of a 4x4 four four multi-dimensional array and I was iterating through it but now I want to be able to pass him parameters you know by or be able to do multi-size arrays if you had hard code pasted that code effectively all over the place then you'd have to go find every one of those for loops that might you know nested for structures that might take that and add that ability those variables figure out how you're gonna feed them in all over, whatever but if you had factored that out to a method early after you just repeated yourself a very few times when that program or module or component was still very small, then you could um, just extend that interface and just go, okay, I'll just add a couple, you know, a couple of variables onto that one if the programming language permits, or maybe just add a, an entire different method that whatever can do some calculation, whatever, you know, there's an infinite possibilities, but you could very simply extend that interface in one place. And the next letter, of course, is O, which stands for the open closed principle. That means we want our programs open for extension and closed for modification. So that has a lot of overlap leading in from what I was just talking about with the other thing is that, is that exactly, is that you want to be able to add parameters and, um, but without modifying, you don't want to modify what's already happening like as far as what the user can send to you through an interface an interface is basically roughly speaking like a method and if you ex let me see what other bullet points i have here so a published public api must always work the same way when supplied with the same parameters closed for modification so that's exactly what i was trying to get at i just wanted to make sure i put the bullet point up before i say it and get all redundant but um yeah, you want to be able to just keep providing that interface, ideally for as long as possible, right? If you think of like a REST API on the web, stuff like that, it's nice if it's always there and works. But if all of a sudden there's a major change to that interface, it could break break an unknown amount of programs that are trying to use it, you know? So as soon as you're sharing your API, if you create some form of like, you know, that public keyword, any, anywhere you're using something like that, then as soon as somebody else gets their hands on it, you're kind of obligated to just uphold that interface, you know, take those same parameters, all that kind of stuff, which is fine, but just keep that in mind, right? That's the idea. Otherwise you have to do like a major version change on your interface, 2.0 to 3.0 kind of thing, and then uh, maintain two separate, you know, major versions of a back end or whatever. And that's just not ideal. So, the less that that happens, the better. But we still should be able to extend it in the future to take new parameters as well. So being closed for modification, of course, that means that it doesn't 
doesn't mean that it can't evolve over time or anything like that. We just need to think about how we're designing it so that it can evolve over time. And uh, design patterns, if you're familiar with those, if your language seems to have barriers to this open for extension, closed for modification kind of stuff, look into design patterns, especially Java, it, languages like that claim to be early implementers of object-oriented purity or something, but they're not. It, Java, for example, is, I would say, mostly impure when it comes to object-oriented programming. It leaned a little bit more towards it than the previous implementations of last century, but um, that's why we have so many design patterns for especially that language and the very similar languages like that is because there were a lot of things that you just couldn't do very easily. And if you think a language is more like Java, or excuse me, JavaScript, um, Python, and Ruby, the reason you might not see so many specific design patterns with those languages is because they don't need them as much. It's You can do these things that take a lot of crufty code and thought to uh, accomplish in a language like Java. You can do very easily in those more dynamic languages anyway. This Barbara Liskov substitution principle is what this is. Sometimes, uh, I guess, Bob Martin just wanted to make this acronym work and everything, so he, he did Liskov substitution principle, and then it starts sounding like some crazy theorem or something. Um, it's pretty simple, and the reason Liskov is just because it's Barbara Liskov's last name. She is a retired professor from MIT, and was instrumental in defining object-oriented programming way back in the day with L and K. Um, yeah, this one's probably the most object-oriented principle out of all of them, but it can still somewhat apply to other stuff too. So types, classes, should be substitutable with their subtypes, their subclasses. I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. So. A specialized type, which is like a subclass, right, may take the place of a more general type. So if you have, for instance, um, well, I'll just go ahead and read this in order for right now. Um, inherited methods of a subclass should behave in the same fashion as their parent class or superclass. So the reason this is what I was getting at. The result of calling bounce on a ball type, for example, should be compatible with the result of calling that same method on a more specialized type. That is what inheritance should follow, the quote-unquote implementation inheritance in Java if you're using the uh, extends keyword. If you're actually creating a literal subclass of something, it should adhere to this. That is a principle. Not the has a so much, but the is a. Um, has a can apply too, for sure. If you're doing an interface, obviously you're going to provide the behaviors expected of that interface, of that abstract class, or whatever. Um, but speaking of that, whenever, whenever we're doing like a class hierarchy, we shouldn't be doing designing class hierarchies before we start hammering out the code. That's big upfront design. That's horrible for the most part. Um, it should be more thinking. I'm into writing monoliths, honestly. Not leaving them as monoliths, but I initially write everything as a, like a monolith in main. And I just start factoring the code out of main as I go and try and just keep it a screen full or less, you know? And so as soon as I'm scrolling the screen up and down, I'm like, okay. Time to separate the blocks of code if I haven't, slap a comment on them, and start, or if maybe not even take the step to slap the comment on, just think of like what method this should go in, get it out of there, you know, or even if it if it belongs in another class, if it's IO, if I'm doing that in there, whatever. Where was I lost? Talking so much, I'm running out of oxygen to the brain. Um, yeah, so what I was talking about with the inheritance thing is that we should be writing, like, effectively writing the subclasses first, maybe not even as a class, but we should be writing that functionality first. And then when we realize we're duplicating that functionality, you know, there's these objects, and it's like, well, they have a lot in common. 
then that's when we should, or it's probably more obvious than that. It's probably not something that creeps up on us, but that's when we should factor back to, uh, like we should be writing subclasses first, if that makes sense, and then factoring out the parent class, the commonality of the parent classes, instead of writing a parent class first and then trying to like design this class hierarchy. Um, that might seem foreign at first if you're used to that big upfront design thing, but if you just start keeping that in mind as, and try and evolve your process, it, it starts to come very naturally. And the I is the interface segregation principle. That's many specific interfaces, like abstract interfaces, are better than only a single one. So when speaking of object composition, which I don't know if I really spoke of it yet, I mentioned it, um, ideally we want to compose our objects. We don't want to create that hierarchy where we have to draw everything down this like hierarchical line lineage. We want to just be able to like slap it on like clay on the sides, so to speak, if we need it, you know, so that that's back to more of the has a type of an interface or implementation or whatever. Some languages make that hard to do. That's where something like JavaScript with their prototypes and all that stuff actually made, I mean, not necessarily with prototypes per se, but somewhat, um, they make it a lot easier to think from a composition standpoint. And going that prototype route kind of forces you more towards the uh, factory methods, like methods that produce objects instead of a quote unquote like constructor class and stuff. That's a getting a little bit pure maybe for a little bit out of scope for this talk, but um ideally that's what you want. You know, you want um to have a method, a factory method instead of a constructor. Constructors are just straight up a code smell. Like you don't the new keyword is a code smell. If you see that that should be hidden in a factory method because just for one example, like a constructor, one of, they're limited. A constructor in a lot of languages has to have the exact same name as a class. It can't have a descriptive name and it has to return an object. It can't go, oh, actually you really don't want, you don't want an object of me. Maybe you want another object. It can't do that. It has to return you an object of itself, for example, like in Java. Um, but yeah, that's getting straying a little bit off the path here, but a little bit related. So many specific interfaces are better than a single one. Better to have a bunch of granular abstract interfaces rather than one or just a few. You may have heard about like, all I wanted was a banana and I got a gorilla holding a banana and the whole jungle with it. So that's the idea is you want to be able to just have the banana if you want and just worry about that because whatever interfaces we have we have to implement them and we have to bring them in somehow so that adds up if it's you know more than just a few it's like being able to build a very customized universal remote control on the spot with just the required interface components so like if you uh hmm, i guess that i thought of a good example earlier but of course it's escaping me right now but um, basically that that says it right there. Like if you could just have the pieces that you need, you know, like if you want to carry around this gigantic universal remote that works for like every TV known to man or woman and all that kind of stuff, or would you rather, or a calculator or something, do you want to carry around a cash register and a graphing calculator and all this stuff? Or would you rather just have like, start with a basic calculator and then be able to snap on the parts that you care about for that particular task or whatever you're doing. I know with smartphones and stuff like that today, it seems like, oh, well, I can just have a smartphone app that scales. But that's basically the same idea, because even if you open a smartphone app, do you want that app to like think of all the functionality of like a graphing calculator right there on one screen? You know, wouldn't you rather it's nice to have those that functionality off to the side to where you could like swipe it in or whatever you do to to get to that screen that has those functions that you want. But being able to just see that granularity one at a time, you know what I mean? It it helps. It's more of a composable type of thing. Like we compose our interfaces of what we need in a, digest, a digestible fashion. 
and at a little bit more of a technical lower level or whatever with the way that stuff's implemented in the programming languages. Like in Java, if you think of a quote unquote interface, which is like a pure abstract interface more, um, or like a pure abstract class leaning towards. But now with the newer Java, of course, they have like default methods and stuff like that in their interfaces. So it's no longer a pure abstract class. They've just finally allowed that um, multiple inheritance, implementation inheritance. But uh, if you think about it for more of the pure abstract class sense, you would literally have to um, implement every single function that your interface that you promised to implement by bringing in that that quote unquote implements that interface, you know, and uh, so you know if there's just like five methods that you have to implement, then that's easy and it doesn't take up a whole lot of source code. But if that interface came in and it had 200 methods, you would have to at least provide an empty implementation for 200 methods, you know, so you'd have, even if you just literally did just a pair of empty curly braces for every one of those methods, besides one or something, you'd have to have 199 lines of source code in that one file that are just empty unimplemented methods. And then you're effectively, by becoming that quote unquote type that provides that interface, when you pass that object into some method or some other object that maybe you didn't even design or build yourself, they might expect you to implement some of those other methods, you know, because it's like, oh, you said you're a big, huge, whatever type, you know? So anyway, I think you probably see the picture there that being small and granular is definitely could be very beneficial and all hang in on that KISS principle. So the last one is dependency inversion principle, and that's that dependencies are bad, right? I mean, not necessarily, but they kind of like, they're a stench, a code smell that builds up quickly. We don't want to depend especially on third-party libraries, but core libraries aren't quite so bad. You know, we know they're always there and stuff like that, but um, yeah, most especially third-party dependencies. And even our own program, even our own stuff within our own program, the less dependencies we have, the better, you know? So when you see like those import statements, include statements at the top of a source file, if there's more than a very few of those, that's a code smell, you know? What's this thing doing that it needs 12 imports? Like that is a sure sign more than maybe, I don't, just like, I want to say a half dozen, like more than that is definitely, I mean, you can't, it's arbitrary, right? It's like, how long do you wash your hands till they're clean? You can't really say like, a, you know, six imports and you're, you've crossed the line, you know, but it's somewhere about there usually. So that, that's just a sure sign. Look at what those imports are. What are the, you know, is this file IO, especially like in Java, for instance, if they're coming from different packages, like this one's coming from the IO packages, this one's coming from the util packages, stuff like that, those things probably, the IO needs to go off into its own class, most likely. So we need to depend on abstractions, not on concrete implementations. That would be like I think the simplest way to put that that a lot of people could relate to is the uh, the steering wheel, the pedals, the gear shifter, stuff like that in like a car. Um, you're depending on an abstraction right there. You don't know necessarily if that's an electric vehicle, if it's, you know, diesel, gasoline, um, steam powered maybe, whatever. It just, it doesn't even matter because you know if... They're also following the principle of least astonishment and everything works, you know, there'll be a key or something familiar that you can activate to start that vehicle. And you know the steering wheel, you turn the wheel right, the vehicle's probably going to turn right, like stuff like that. It's not surprising. So that's sort of an abstraction if you think about it, because you're abstracted away from that steering wheel is providing you abstraction. You don't know necessarily if the car has power steering or if it has rack and pinion steering or some other electromechanical kind of steering mechanism it doesn't matter and it could change like you could literally have a really good mechanic going and maybe gut the whole thing and change it all out and you still have that same exact steering wheel that you had before 
that to control that stuff and it will work in the way you expect that's the equivalent of like what a method interface is that's that familiarity that you want to provide and you can extend it right you can extend that interface you can add a radio a car stereo to it and cool you know that doesn't interfere with the other parts of the interface that's extra parameters that you can go over there and tune um yeah when designing methods when designing methods interface contracts prefer abstract classes or interfaces to concretions which so uh concretions are non abstract classes they're actual implementation you know so if you're doing that quote unquote inheritance even though those terms are used in from all different perspectives like you can inherit just an interface right but usually when we throw the term around loosely when we're talking about inheritance we're talking about leaning towards implementation inheritance we're talking about like subclassing a concrete class um we want to lean away from that we want to try and avoid that not that it you know it happens but it's just something to think like what are all the, that should be pretty much a last case resort you know not that it's like oh wow i can't believe you know how am i going to sleep tonight i subclass to superclass it's like not that big of a deal but did we at least consider every other option before we did that prefer composition to inheritance right prefer the has a to the is a type of thing and that's something where that's a a blemish in the design of a language like Java is that it's easier to do uh, implementation inheritance. It's easier for me to make a subclass in Java than it is for me to do compose myself of something to create a bring in a new instance of like some other object and then like include that other objects interface extend my own interface with that i have to go in and do that type of a thing where i uh provide like wrap every single method right i have to wrap all the methods i care about in that other interface and then just recall them so that's that's what you got to do in java and that's why that language isn't that pure of an object-oriented language but to inherit it's a lot easier you know it makes that almost effortless you just implement or no i'm sorry that would be an abstract pure abstract interface um it's the extends keyword right you just use the extends keyword and you're there so it makes your it real easy for you to get in trouble and then once you use that extends interface in java then you've used up that multiple or that single inheritance and then if you do decide you want multiple inheritance you've got to use a newer form of java so you've immediately cut out a lot of legacy code if you go that route and then you're going to start trying to do it through um, interfaces with that implements keyword and then you're going to have like two different types of implementation inheritance and oh man whatever and then the other thing too is you also since Java's so strict on typing pure object-oriented programming isn't supposed to be so strict on typing i mean it's there if you want it in some of those languages, obviously, but we should really be using more of a test-driven development approach these days with the more dynamic languages, ideally, because like with Java, you have to, um, if you want to have that security of fulfilling this interface of a certain type, then you have to have like, um, what am I thinking? Like a quote unquote interface in Java, right? The implements interface. So, so somewhere you have to go punch out more code, more typing to type out this empty interface that you're going to implement. And then you can have some other class or method or whatever, um, depend on that interface, that quote unquote interface. Right. And then you provide that. So there's just at the end of the day, it's like so much, talking and typing and stuff just to describe this one thing of like okay i just want to provide a few methods on my object that you know do this stuff that this other object wants but anyway that's the way it goes with those languages depend on the interface not on the implementation so we want to um to keep things at a high level to keep things abstract to keep things encapsulated all of that kind of stuff. And the other thing, like especially with like the standard in and out at the consoles and stuff like that, 
that's a good example. Speaking of the Liskov back at the Liskov substitution principle, where I was like, you can even apply that to non quote unquote object oriented programming languages. So like the streams of that are like, you can write to standard out like it's a stream because it is. And, uh, but you can also stream to a file, right? So you can, it's basically just having something open to write bytes or whatever in sequence. And by doing that, that provides you this abstraction to where you're like, okay, I can just open this thing as a quote unquote, some kind of a stream as this abstract str stream type, so to speak. And then I can just start sending data down that wire. And that that's an abstraction versus if I were to think like, oh, this is a block device and, you know, I need to da 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 about all these specifics about how a particular disk works and sector sizes or whatever, you know, when you start getting into more of the low level operating system type of world, the idea is let those operating systems do that if you can, you know, try and not write to, even if it's a hardware implementation like that, just try not to write to that, try and write abstractly. And by writing abstractly, we separate ourselves from that. If we start leaning towards the abstract world, then we think like, in general, like, how am I going to access a door? Like, I'm, is that, does that door have a knob? Does it have a lever? Does it have a push plate? Whatever. If I start thinking too specifically about the implementation of that door, then I'm going to be like, oh, this door has a lever. So just turn the lever to open the door, right? That's sort of an example. Um, of a, like a very human interface. But then later, like if I was writing a robot, right, to deal with this human interface, I could program it to open the lever. But then when it comes to a pull handle on a door, it might not know what to do. It's a completely foreign interface, but that's programming to the implementation. If I have programmed to an abstraction of like open door, right? My robot just has an open door abstraction and its little procedure of getting through a door. Then behind the scenes, if I wanted to, I could have like some type of algorithmic pattern that, you know, some design pattern or whatever that figures out what type of handle it is. And then as we come across more handles, like, oh yeah, then there's that knob, you know, I, I didn't program that in because the environment we were in didn't have a knob. It had a lever and a push plate and a pull handle and all that stuff, but there was no knob. Well, cool, because we don't have to go back and program in that robot so much. You know, we only have to change that one component because we've isolated it and separated it through abstractions or whatever. That one little concretion, ideally, in there, we can just go in and reprogram and recompile that one thing, you know, because ideally it's answering back out to those abstract those abstractions like it's providing its own connections there and that's where like using adapters i added that one in there because that's what we can do if the whole world isn't perfect right there right we can so if i'm writing a program that's going to work on ideally on say like windows and linux um i can write an adapt instead of using like the, uh, what, it's been a minute now, but there's like a write console, if I'm remembering correctly, that to write to the console, that's the Windows system interface to do it, to bypass the whole um, print F on C, right? If I just wanted to like write an assembly language program, not pull in the C libraries or something, I'd just do like write console or whatever it is. I'd call that one specific thing and it would work in its own specific way and it's probably way unlike most other, you know, at least different parameters of different sizes, different orders, different method name, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if I just, like I said, back to that display function, if I just say, hey, display text, or even ideally just display, you know, then maybe through a command line parameter, it could invoke what type of display, or it could automatically detect it, or it could change it dynamically via some setting, or at load time from a configuration file the possibilities are pretty much endless and uh but i just say hey display this and then if i wanted to if i wanted my program i'm like no you know i want to log this to like the console then maybe i could have like log console just like javascript right console.log like those types of things so start general and then decide from there like what strategy 
and leave yourself all those options. And that's what doing the adapter thing is, is that, you know, give yourself that steering wheel always. Don't don't go in and try and work the gears yourself because that could uh, very, very easily change. It's more hassle than it's worth. It makes your program not portable and um, you, you're just too dependent. You know, you can't you become rigid. But anyway, those are the programming principles and I took a long time describing them, which I didn't think I would, but if you listen this far, I appreciate it. And I think you'll make a better programmer than a lot of people. So quick review on them. KISS, keep it short and simple. Don't overcomplicate it, right? Always focus on that. Oh, if you just, if nothing else, if you don't take away anything else from this video, take away that one principle right there. Because you can figure out everything else that matters. Like, should I use this design pattern here? Is that keep it simple? Should I use this interface that has a locale and all this other stuff in it? Well, there, you're only using it on your computer with your single locale and it seems to work without that. Do it that way, right? Don't go in and do anything more than you absolutely have to. Just that's your answer right there is what's simple. And then by doing that too, you always are keeping in mind that things can change and very likely will, right? So as long as you have that idea in your head, you'll be thinking, hey, I've, I've got to keep it simple, but I know there's this complexity out there waiting to happen. So I'll keep things abstract, encapsulated, generalized, all that good stuff. And doing that keeps everything simple. When you abstract those details of how the car gears turn your wheels, you're keeping it simple with that steering wheel. You don't ever have to think about that going down the road unless something goes wrong, right? And then even then you might be able to just call in an expert and not have to ever think about it yourself. So like I said, everything hangs on that one principle. Do simple first, that way everything stays simple. You never bring in too much, or if you do, at least you did it right to begin with. And you always can go back to that, ideally. Try, don't repeat yourself too much. As soon as you notice you're repeating yourself, it's all right. Just figure out what's being repeated and make that singular and separate and in one place so that it only has to change in one place and then pass parameters to it for what's different. Um, that's leaning towards the idea of having like a, maybe a single method with a lot of parameters. But if that method is trying to do too many things at once, if that and instead of a then kind of a thing, or if you're passing the method a Boolean flag that's saying, Whatever, those are signs that that method might be trying to do too many things. So maybe make a second method instead of having the and or the boolean kind of stuff. Just go ahead and make a second method. And even if that second method has to call the first method, whatever. Pull a principle of least astonishment. Don't be surprising. Make that road nice and fresh paved with clear markers on it and smooth sailing for you and whoever else might look at that code in six days or six months or 17 years from now or whatever it is um why not you're already putting in a lot of effort just it's easier to think about how you want to polish your code than it is to think about how that algorithm's working right especially if you got to come back and think about how that algorithm's working if you polish your code you're going to push that algorithm out. You're going to encapsulate all of that ugliness somewhere. And then if you ever need to go back to it, you know, it's behind that pretty, you know, it's behind that lipstick on that pig. Like that's where you'll find it. Yagni, you ain't going to need it. So don't implement it until you absolutely do period. End of story. You don't need a graphical user interface yet. You don't need to be able to play a WAV file. You don't need a login. You don't need a bunch of security. You don't need that third party framework. You know, don't use MySQL for that database. Go in and implement a comma separated values file. If you've got something like Python, that's built into the standard library, like fairly richly. So if you can get it out of the standard library, then you can avoid implementing yourself. Otherwise, 
how hard is it to implement a comma separated values thing? Yeah, you might not be able to do one that handles every form of Unicode and every type of CSV file that somebody might throw at, you know, possibly throw at you. But if you just do it for your purposes and know that like, hey, most likely if this program does hang around, if this client does like it, it's probably going to scale. And if multiple clients end up wanting to buy it and whatever it takes off, then for instance, uh, then yeah, you might have to bring in an SQL database, right? But because you kept the idea that at some point I might have to make this work with that MySQL interface, but for now I'm just going to do a dirt simple plain text CSV file for that database, or even an in-memory one first, right? And then eventually a CSV, stuff like that. Now you're already thinking multiply. You're already thinking of those changing low-level implementation details, so you're going to start abstracting. You're going to be like, okay, I can just save row or whatever. That might even be too low level of thinking. Like you just think very much towards the module that's doing it like how it ideally thinks. You know, it shouldn't have to have much of any knowledge about how things go on at any lower detail. If anything, just this next lowest possible little increment of a level below itself. But yeah, you do that. So then... You know, even though you're writing to a CSV file, you, you know, you're keeping those options open. You're keeping your program open for that extension to run MySQL, but you're abstracting those details away. And later on, you won't have to go in and modify it because if you just write straight, not only is it going to follow the violate the whole you're not going to need it principle, because what if they come in and say, hey, it's not MySQL, it's Microsoft SQL they need, right? And it's like, oh, man. I hard coded all those MySQL calls. Like it's totally 100% hard coded to MySQL. That sucks, right? You know, it might be slightly more efficient for the initially just by doing that, but the the trade off in the long run is just horrible. So you abstract all that junk away because it's probably going to change. The solid principle, single responsibility. Do that one thing. Do that one thing well. If you say this and that it's bad it should be only this one thing it should only send this thing over here it should only fetch that from there like those kinds of things you know there might vary or what it fetches might vary but it only fetches you know like whatever those types of things open for change close for modification um, all of our stuff we want it to be able to change we want it to change in only one spot but we don't want to modify anything that the outside world expects. We want to be able to change internally, but we don't want to modify our interface. We want to be able to extend it, add that car stereo, add, add that glove depart compartment, add power windows, add power seats, but we don't want that to change. We don't want to change the steering or the pedals in the process. Subtypes is super types. So simple enough, right? You know, otherwise don't use that type of inheritance. Use the has a composition, just bring in other things. Like otherwise, if you provide a quote unquote type that is a quote unquote subtype, it's expected that that can go provide for a more general type. And that's not a big deal. Just do it. If that's the route you're going, then do it. You know, all balls should be able to bounce, right, if so to speak. Small granular interfaces. It all seems obvious now in hindsight, but just these are the things to remember right here, one page. Keep them small. You don't want to have to go in and implement a huge giant interface that you'll never live up to. Just so much easier. Depend on abstractions, not on concretions. So if you are depending on a con concretion, separate it with an abstraction have the concretion talk to the abstraction have you talk on the other end excuse me talk to the abstraction don't let them directly touch put those gloves in the middle and of course pulp principle of least privilege don't give anything any more privileges than are absolutely necessary to carry out the task at hand i think that's it so Thanks a lot, and have a good one.